Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the 10th episode of Audubon's I Saw a Bird Show. My name is David Ringer, coming at you from New York City, New York, and I saw a bird today, actually several. I was doing an early morning run along the Hudson River, and our local herring gull juveniles have left their rooftop nests on the industrial buildings along the river and are now gathering out in the river. So got a lot of fresh young herring gulls venturing out into the world here in New York. How about you, Christine? That's awesome. I remember seeing a lot of herring gulls uh, when I've been in New York as well. And recently being as someone who is living in Texas right now, I saw a roadrunner. And this was actually a lifer for me of seeing a roadrunner for the first time. This bird was literally on the road running across the street uh, into the bushes. So that was very exciting. We can take a look at one right now. That is what the roadrunner was and taken as its emission from the Audubon Photography Awards, which we will be talking about very soon. So we have a very exciting show lined up for you all today. And we are going to be interviewing the one and only David Allen Sibley. Then we are going to take a behind the scenes look at the Audubon Photography Awards. We're also going to be talking to two of the judges this year. And then we are going to try and stump our panel of experts with some of the worst bird picks that we've asked everyone to submit over this past week. And as always, we will end with one thing you can do for birds this week. So a lot of fun things lined up and I'm super excited. Yes, um, well, let's jump right in. It's truly a pleasure to be able to welcome our first guest to the show. David Allen Sibley is an author, illustrator, and of course, an avid birder who began painting birds when he was just seven years old. He's the author of numerous Sibley guides and we're sure that many of our viewers have uh, one or more David Sibley's books on your shelves at home. Uh, we've been immensely fortunate to partner with David Sibley on a number of initiatives over the years, including portions of our online bird field guide to North American birds. David, welcome to the show. We're so thrilled to have you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, one of the questions that we've asked a few of our guests during the run of I Saw a Bird is, uh, why do you think birds are having a moment right now in the United States? Yeah, I think um, I think there's there's this universal appeal to birds. People have always been fascinated by birds. Their sense, the, their ability to fly, the sense of freedom, their movement, their beauty, all those things. But I think it's partly just um, craving a connection to nature. Um, there's a lot of a lot of medical psychological research that shows real measurable benefits to being in nature, even just looking out a window at nature. And birds give us just a great engaging way to connect with nature. So I think that's a big part of it. And also it's, it's inherently an optimistic kind of forward looking hobby. It's always, I saw something exciting today. I wonder what I'll see tomorrow. Um, there's always something to look forward to. And I think that is really appealing right now. Yeah, I think Love that's it. so true. And even a lot of my friends right now who are all remote, but even people who aren't birders will send me texts like, oh, I saw this bird. What is it? Yeah. So it just goes to show that it's birds are the kind of thing that everyone can appreciate, especially in this time. So I have a question for you, David, that it's a two part question. But first, mm -hmm. I want to res uh, I want to let viewers drop questions um, for David Sibley in the comments, either on Facebook or Zoom. So if you have anything throughout the segment, just keep those questions coming. So my question for you is, what is your favorite bird to draw? And on the contrary, what has been your most difficult bird to draw? Yeah, um, yeah that's, uh, you know, picking favorites is always tough. <laughs> um, uh, and I guess those, those don't have to be different. They could be the same. So I'll say owls are, as a group, I, I really enjoy owls. It's one of my favorite groups of birds. I really enjoy drawing them, partly because they make such good, um, good subjects for drawing. Because <laughs> when you find an owl in the daytime, it's usually just sitting still for hours and uh, makes a really good, uh, easy subject to sit down for a study. Um, and difficult because they're so different from other birds that the things that you learn from drawing, say a robin, a warbler, a chickadee, 
not all of that applies to owls because their facial structure, their shape, their posture is so different from other birds. So you have to learn a whole new structure, a whole new way of drawing. Um, so I think I'm going to put owl as, as both, the, the favorite and the most difficult. That's a good one. And you also shared one of uh, your guides on how to draw an owl. So that's on, yeah, that's on Audubon's website as well. Yes, and speaking of that, you've been doing a number of videos where people can draw along with you. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what drawing birds means during a stressful time like this. How does it make you feel and what have you heard from others who have participated? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it was really fun to do these, uh, these drawing videos and it, um, for me, well, I like, uh, there's a, a quote that I really like. It was written by uh, Peter Steinhardt, who is a former editor of Audubon magazine. And in, in a book he wrote about drawing, he said, a drawing is a picture of your understanding. Drawing is kind of a meditative in a way. The, um, you have to get your, get your mind into the space where you're just looking at something and really taking it all in and converting it into lines on a sheet of paper. Um, and I think that's, um, it is, it's a very um, thoughtful, um, meditative kind of activity. And, um, and it really, it, you learn a lot from it. It's, it's, um, it builds. So I think that's uh, part of the, the appeal of drawing is all of that together. So David, we have a question coming in from one of our viewers named Christopher. And Christopher wants to know how many hours a day do you spend drawing and how long does it take you to produce a really good drawing? Um, you know, the amount of time I spend drawing varies a lot and it's less, less lately back in the, you know, when I was traveling and birding full time and, and sketching full time, I was drawing kind of I could say drawing full time all day, every day, but the actual time with pencil on paper was very small. It might take me, you know, I might spend half an hour watching a bird and two minutes out of that half hour actually sketching. There's a lot of time that's just watching, figuring things out, um, trying to memorize the shapes, the lines, and then translate that onto paper. Um, so the amount of time it takes to do a really good drawing could be, if you just count the drawing time, <laughs> it could be two or three minutes. Um, but it's, it's half an hour or an hour of just studying, watching, kind of taking it all in before you can do that. And there's, of course, years of, years of, of practice and study and, and learning before you get to that point. Uh, but it, it all, you keep, every drawing is, is practice for the next one. Every drawing makes you better for the next one. So it just keeps building. Yeah. And for beginners out there, such as myself, your, your videos, David, are extremely helpful. I've actually tried one of your videos myself. I can, it's not the best photo, but I tried a ruby-throated hummingbird um, yeah, using nice. your guide. So for anyone in the audience, I see some questions asking where they can find these videos. We're gonna be dropping a link to David Sibley's video guides in the comments and you'll be able to find the full videos there. And if you use the hashtag sketch with, sketch with Sibley on Instagram, you'll see a bunch of other people's sketches as well. So it's super fun. And on that note, you are an accomplished illustrator, but you're also an accomplished naturalist and scientist. So do you have any advice that you'd like to give anyone in our audience who might be an aspiring artist or aspiring scientist themselves? Yeah, I think, I know for me, um, it all started, starts with just observation and asking questions, curiosity. So it, it's, um, and I think that's probably true of all, all great discoveries in the world. It begins with just observation and curiosity. If somebody, you notice something and you wonder about it. And I can't stress enough the time, the time that I spent in the field um, in my 20s, just traveling and birding and sketching, 
um, not even painting, just watching birds and drawing with pencil on paper. That's when I learned so much about, about the birds, about drawing, and that kind of uh, deep study and, and uh, observation and, and watching for patterns, kind of learning patterns, fitting things together. Um, that's that's got to be the foundation of um, anything that you go on to do. So I would say follow your passion to be outdoors and watch the birds, watch nature, um, look for patterns, notice things, wonder about them, read, ask questions. Um, and uh, that if you do that, you'll uh, you'll be able to go on and do great things with all that all that you learn from that. I love that. It's that openness, not skipping over things or rushing to judgment, but curiosity. It's a great answer, David. It's certainly yeah. taken you far. Yeah. Um, you've also said that, well, you know, on this theme, one of your greatest satisfactions is learning new things about the natural world. And I'm wondering if you could share maybe one or two things that you think are some of the greatest mysteries still about birds in North America. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many, so many things are still unknown. And I tried to highlight a lot of that in my new book, um, pointing out the things that aren't known, that, that uh, are still waiting to be confirmed or even discovered. Um, and I mentioned the, um, you know, the fact that birds like MERS, related to puffins, these seabirds, they dive down 600 feet or more deep in the ocean where there's essentially Amazing. no light and they catch fish down there so aside from the pressure 20 it's pressure 20 times greater than what we experience here at the surface incredible pressure total darkness and they're catching fish and no one knows how they do it no one really knows exactly what they do down there <laughs> <laughs> you wow. can't watch them. Um, so that's, to me, that's one of the biggest, or that, that always strikes me as a huge remaining question. But see, even common backyard birds like chimney swift, I often talk about that. Chimney swift is a bird that millions and millions of people live with in their backyard. And nobody actually knows what they do all day. They fly out of the chimney in the morning and fly around somewhere and come back with food to feed their young and spend the night in the chimney. But exactly where they go when they leave the chimney is a complete unknown. The, the answer seems fairly obvious. They must go up into the sky, but how high, how far? Um, what are they doing up there? It's still unknown. It's a bird that lives in everyone's backyard. And um, so many questions like that. It's amazing and inspiring, and I hope some of our viewers will be people who can help solve those riddles someday. Wow. Um, great, great answer. Uh, we have a question, David, from one of our viewers named Lynn, and please remember to keep dropping your questions for David in the chat. Uh, so David, Lynn wants to know whether you had a spark bird. Ah, uh, yeah, I think we all do. Um, mine is um, yellow-headed blackbird. Well, I have a couple. Yellow-headed blackbird was um, the first bird I remember seeing. So my father's an ornithologist, and, and on, when I was young, we would go out on weekend picnics and things. And one day I remember being out in the, <clears throat> in the desert in Southern California on a family picnic, and there was a flock of male yellow-headed blackbirds lined up on a telephone wire. And just such a stunning image. These black blackbirds with bright yellow heads just lined up on the wire. That was my my first real memory of birds. And my my older brother started his life list with that bird right there on the spot. And a few wow. months later I realized there was there was great value in having a life list also to compete with my brother. So <laughs> <laughs> So I waited until I was out on a walk with my father and my brother had stayed home and we saw a great horned owl. So I started my oh, life wow. with a great horned owl. But, um, and both of those birds, I still remember uh, 
very clearly. Um, that was my, uh, but the yellow-headed blackbird, I guess, was really the spark. The, the uh, owl was more of a competitive kind of one-upping sort of spark bird. <laughs> <laughs> those are both great birds. Yeah, those are both really cool. I still have yet to see a yellow-headed blackbird, so mm. I would love to, to add that to my life list, which I also started recently. So kind of on that topic, one thing that we hope to bring to everyone with this I Saw a Bird Show is to bring both nature and birds a little closer to home. And we kind of touched a little bit on that earlier, but I was curious if you have any specific ways that you've come to appreciate the birds outside your window in this time. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. I My, my style of work and birding has always been um, I work at home, <laughs> I go birding by walking out the door and, and looking at the birds that are right outside. Um, and my, my approach to birding has always been very slow paced and studious. So uh, for me, life during this pandemic has not been all that different. Um, and I hear from a lot of other birders who are discovering that sort of that style of birding and really enjoying it. This, you know, just looking at the birds in their backyard and their neighborhood, um, unable to travel very far. Um, and, and they're really enjoying that experience of paying more attention to the birds that are right in their neighborhood. And for me, it's all about, again, it's all about asking questions. So I've been taking advantage of the, the fact that I haven't been traveling at all this spring. I've been home. We're lucky to live in a place where there are lots of birds, so I can I've been paying special attention to the songs and calls of the birds and kind of tracking those through the seasons. And it's been really fascinating to watch, listen <laughs> to how the, the songs and calls have changed through the course of the season. Um, the singing behavior of the birds um, changes week to week. Um, some species sing more, some sing less, some change their songs at different times of the breeding cycle. Then the young birds come out like they have in the last couple of weeks and that suddenly the, the soundscape is all <laughs> the, the incessant chirping of baby birds of all different stripes. And um, so that's been really fascinating for me being, being able to watch one place um, every day since March and, and hear the difference as the soundscape changes. Um, that's been my uh, my real benefit for me of uh, one thing I've really enjoyed about this spring and just just being able to to watch those changes and and pay closer attention to the really common birds that are right here in the backyard. Yeah, and really build that familiarity. Um, David Miles, one of our viewers tonight, wants to know whether you have had the pleasure of observing in person every single bird that you've drawn in your field guides. Uh, Great question, no, Miles. Yeah, not not quite. Um, I um, there there are a few species. Well, in the first edition of the guide, I, I illustrated 810 species, and I had seen all but 10 of them somewhere in the world. I had had experience wow. with 800 of them. Since then, I've seen I think six of those 10. But in the second edition of the book, I added a lot more rare species. So. I haven't even counted how many of those, there's probably 30 or 40 now that I painted that I've never seen. And that's, it's more difficult and it's a lot less satisfying to paint those because I don't, I can't just sit back from the painting and look at it and know whether it looks right or not. I have to constantly compare it to photographs and, and other references to see if I'm getting it right. Um, but yeah, it's a, <clears throat> uh, probably about 30 species in the book that I've painted and never seen. Um, and I'm looking forward to someday getting a chance to see all of those. Yes, it's amazing. Yeah, that's a, that's a cool goal to have. At least you can say you've seen nearly all of them that you've yes. seen. <laughs> <laughs> so we have another art question from one of our viewers named Erica, and that's what are your favorite materials using drawing or inking or for adding colors to your drawings? Yeah, so the, 
the um, um, for the bird guide, I did all those paintings in gouache, which is opaque watercolor, and I used um, Bristol board, uh, a pretty standard Bristol board paper with a rough surface. Um, and uh, for the tree guide, when I did the guide to trees, I illustrated all those with acrylic. And then my new book, What It's Like to Be a Bird, I continued with acrylic. Um, it's a lot freer <laughs> in a way. It's, uh, it's more forgiving um, and I, I paint quite large and I've painted, the paintings are even larger for the, what it's like to be a bird. Um, so uh, the original paintings are quite large and I can use a big brush and, and be pretty loose and um, a little bit sloppy almost in the, in the painting. And when, when it's reduced to appear in the book, it looks a lot more, uh, <laughs> looks like I took a lot more care than I actually did. Um, but just to go back to media, one of, you know, back in the early, my early days, I did all pencil on paper. And that's still one of my favorite um, things to work with. And um, I did a lot of pen and ink and I really, really enjoyed scratch board, which is a technique of um, a heavy paper a board with um, some white, a thin layer of white plaster on it. You add ink, do a drawing in ink, and then you can scratch off some of the ink to create to add more detail, to fix lines, to create different effects. And I really enjoyed Scratchboard um, and illustrated a book called um, Wind Masters that has a lot of uh, Scratchboard illustrations of hawks. Um, but that's, so I, I've done, I haven't done much Scratchboard in the last 20 years, but it's still one of my favorite media to work with. Well, thank you. That's fascinating and I hope helpful and inspiring to many of our viewers and artists out there. Uh, so David, we've talked a little bit about your new book, What It's Like to Be a Bird, and we'd love to bring the segment to a close by hearing you read an excerpt from your book, and then we'll drop the link in the chat for those who want to learn more. All right. So I've, I've got a paragraph about Rose-breasted grosbeak. Uh, related to cardinals, the grosbeaks are highly migratory, nesting across the U.S. and southern Canada and wintering in Central America. Why migrate? There are many downsides to migration. It's dangerous and energy intensive and it requires extreme adaptations. Even brain size is linked to migratory habits. Large brains require a lot of energy, making them incompatible with long distance flights. So migratory species average smaller brains. But about 19% of the world's bird species and huge numbers of birds migrate every year. Migrants are able to nest in areas with reduced competition and a burst of abundant food. Basically, they're traveling farther to get cheap food and lodging. The trip is not easy, but the deals are so good it's worth the extra distance. The energy used to travel is paid back by the energy gained in the northern summer. Really beautiful, David. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to drop a link in the chat here uh, for those who want to learn more about your book. I know it's really resonating with folks. And David, you've done so much for birds and for the people who love them. We're, you're an inspiration to us. Thank you for being on the show tonight. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so right. much. Our best to you and your family. Thanks. You too. So now we're going to pivot to the next section about the Audubon Photography Awards. So each year, Audubon presents the best in bird photography by announcing the winners of the Audubon Photography Awards. And 2020 marked our 11th year of the annual awards, during which we saw more than 6,000 submissions. And our panel of judges spent days studying each of these entries and then assembled in a huge day-long Zoom meeting, because we have been more remote this year, to determine the 10 winners and honorable mentions, which is a task that I do not envy given the number of entries that we get each year. So let's take a look at some of the final winners this year.
Wow, all these photos are truly amazing. So to talk about the Audubon Photography Awards, we are super excited to welcome to the show two of this year's judges. So Alan Mirabayashi is the chairman and co-founder of Photo Shelter, and he's also an avid photographer. And then Melissa Grew is a wildlife photographer, writer, and conservationist with a passion for educating people about the marvels of the natural world. She has also just come out with an online bird photography masterclass, which is available through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So welcome to the show, Melissa and Alan. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Great to have you both. So we'll start with a question that I'd like each of you to answer, and that's how you got started in photography. Alan, let's hear from you first and then from Melissa, how you got started in photography. I was the kid in high school carrying a camera around with me. This is back in the film days. Uh, so I was that nerd. And then when digital photography came around in the early 2000s, it just made photography so much more accessible. And I've actually had the pleasure of uh, working with Melissa for many, many years as faculty at a, a photography workshop called the Summit Nature Workshop. And that has really opened my eyes into the world of nature and wildlife and specifically bird photography. So anytime I'm back home in Hawaii, I'm out looking for white terns and other species that we have out here. And it's, it's always a joy. Beautiful, one of my favorite birds. Melissa, how about you? How did you get started with photography? Well, I feel like I came to it a little bit later in life. Um, I took up photography as a hobby uh, after my daughter was born, and it was about probably 2010, 2011, I sort of discovered bird photography and just was completely hooked from day one. I just completely fell in love with birds and really, in general, wildlife photography. But, but certainly birds have, have been what I've mainly focused on, partly because they're so numerous, you know, they're, they're all around us wherever we are. And so they're, they're a great subject for us to turn to, but I did my bird beauty and their diversity. And um, so it quickly became a full-time thing for me. I, I became a professional photographer a few years later. And um, I was very lucky to win the Audubon Grand Prize in 2015 with this photo of a male great egret uh, displaying that was taken in Florida. And Beautiful. that was in 2015 that I, I won the grand prize award. And since then I've served on the jury and that's been a great honor and it's been a lot of fun too. Yeah, so you've actually served on the judging panel for a number of years. And I'm curious, have you seen any general trends that you've noticed from all these submissions? Yeah, I think there's a few trends for sure. There's a lot more youth, which is wonderful. We're getting a lot more youth submissions. Um, I think over the years, I've seen a lot more women entering the field, which has been great. And I also think that people are really taking a lot of time now to sort of execute a vision. I feel like people are really going out there with a, a particular vision in mind and the species they really wanna work on. And they're really putting the time in to come up with something unusual and unique and that's exciting. Um, and then I think I'm also seeing that people are turning their lenses on common birds and finding sort of special moments and special behavior with common birds, which I, I think is really wonderful. I'm a big fan of that. Yes, for sure. And I think given the circumstances we're living with right now, there's even more opportunity to do that. Right. Um, so Alan, uh, could you talk to us from the perspective of one of the judges, what goes into a winning photo in the Audubon Photography Awards? Is it the patience or talent of the photographer? Is it the technology or the equipment? Some combination of those or maybe something different? I would uh, liken it to uh, a sports analogy, which is you can show up to a stadium with a camera and maybe get a, a good shot of the winning touchdown or the winning basket. But the more that you're prepared and the more that you know the behaviors of specific players, the, the higher chance you'll get of, of getting a spectacular photo rather than a good photo and less reliant on luck. Of course, there's always a component of serendipity, but I think the photos that we've seen that are, are prize winning because they're so unusual, because they're so incredible, are the people that have gone out 
uh, time after time and really tried to understand behavior and really think about light and composition. And so when all of those things come together, that's when you know you, you're seeing a great photo. And uh, I, I think in contrast to, um, you know, when, when David Sib Sibley draws a field guide type photo, he's doing it to present the, the bird in a very um, identifiable way. And yet when we go to the contest side, we're not really looking for field guide style photos. We're looking for something that really opens our eyes. And so, you know, I think the way that people see the world and then the way that the judges are interpreting what we're seeing in the entries um, is, is really fascinating and that makes it a lot of fun. Yeah, that's a good point. And it's a good tip because there's so many elements that go into a photo, not just the bird itself. So the photo we have on screen right now is actually from one of our APA categories, which is plants for birds. So I was wondering, Alan, if you could talk a little bit about this plants for birds category and why it's important. Yeah, so I actually was born and raised in Hawaii. So uh, I, I picked this photo taken by Brent Nainoa Mossman. And, you know, when we were in the judging room in Zoom looking at this photo, I think we all talked about this, this category of endemic birds and endemic species. And the first thing we all said is, isn't it, isn't it interesting how the beak mimics the flower? And then when you take a step back, you're like, well, that's because that's an evolutionary <laughs> feature of the bird. Um, this is a this is a EEV. It's a type of honey creeper, endemic honey creeper. Um, it is uh, threatened uh, in part because of invasive species, but also because of uh, uh, malaria. Um, so it's forced higher, higher up into uh, the mountains and elevation. And this is a type of uh, lobelioid flower. It's a it's a bell flower that's also endemic to Hawaii. And, you know, in Hawaii, we're isolated, isolated landmass. So there's been a lot of specialization that's occurred over the years. And all of this stuff together makes you appreciate uh, the species and where they appear in the world and has made me more curious about um, the environment that I live in. And the other interesting thing is the red uh, feathers from this bird were used for Hawaiian royalty and their capes and their helmets. And so you begin to understand the cultural intersection of nature, wildlife, people, um, and how that all comes together. And I think that's the fascinating thing about birding and, and, and nature photography is you can keep going down these rabbit holes and find more and more interesting things. Mm -hmm. Very well said. It reminds me of a line from a Chilean poet, Pablo Neruda, and the English translation is, bird by bird, I've come to know the earth which I've always found really beautiful. Um, so thank you for that, Alan. Melissa, you're one of the leading voices in ethical wildlife photography, and we'd love for you to talk a little bit about what that means and why it's so important. Sure, it's definitely a subject I'm passionate about. Um, ethical photography is really just simply about putting the welfare of the bird first. Um, it's an approach to bird photography that starts with the bird's needs and habits and, and disposition and sort of works backwards from that. And so it really, it really sort of demands that when we go out there that we go sort of armed with some basic knowledge about the natural history of our subject. And there's so many resources available to us now online you know, whether it's Audubon's Field Guide to North American Birds or uh, Cornell Law of Ornithology's All About Birds website, where we can really learn about um, species different needs and uh, sort of nesting habits and all that stuff. So but the way I really like to frame it and talk about it is, is sort of empathy and how can we practice empathy and compassion when we're out there? Because I really feel like ethics uh, stems from empathy and how can we sort of minimize our impact and um, and really be out there and celebrate nature but yet at the same time you know leave as little trace as possible uh, because we have to remember that for, for us this is about photos but for birds every single moment is about survival and so you know as long as we're not unnecessarily disturbing a bird from really important life processes like feeding young or resting or feeding, um, then, you know, that's a good place to start. 
And, and the funny thing is, it's like best for our photography as well as best for the birds, because if birds are really relaxed and comfortable with us and they don't feel stressed or harassed or crowded, they're going to engage in natural behavior. And those are the photos, you know, that I think are really the most powerful and unique or sort of those, those moments of, of natural behavior and giving in viewers an insight into what the lives are really like of birds. So, yeah. That's it, that's sort of it. That's actually. beautiful, thank you. Uh, and you uh, collaborated with Audubon staff on the creation of our own ethical bird photography guidelines. And we're gonna drop the link in the chat right now so that folks who are interested in uh, seeing what that really looks like in practice can check it out. Yeah, and Audubon has a, has a lot of great resources in their photography section on the website on, on ethics, a lot of great articles that we've, um, sort of populated that with and um, but yeah mm -hmm. that ethical guidelines it's amazing I see so many people sharing it and I I feel like Audubon's been a real leader in this regard in terms of really laying out it's not like it's rules but it's best practices sort of what are the best practices that we can employ when we're out there that really honor and respect the birds right and it's, it's great to, to follow them because it helps not only the birds but it helps with your photography as well exactly so we actually have a question from a viewer named Colleen who asks, do you think that digital photography has promoted a greater interest in birding in nature or in general? And Melissa, do you want to tackle that question? Um, I'm sorry, repeat the question. So it was, do you think that digital photography um, has promoted a greater interest in birding or in nature in general? Absolutely. I mean, I think digital photography has made you know, really great photos within reach of, of any of us. You know, I look back at the days of photography and I, I look at the work of photographers who were shooting then, shooting birds, and I just, I'm just in awe because I, I just don't think I could have done it. I mean, digital photography, we can take as many pictures as we want. We can get instant feedback. Um, things are becoming more uh, sort of um, easy to carry and, uh, affordable. So absolutely, I think that digital photography has, has provided really great access to, um, to birds and bird photography. Well, and here's a related question, Alan, for you from one of our viewers named Kumu. Uh, Kumu asks, do you think a smartphone photo could ever be a winning photo in a competition like the Audubon Photography Awards? Yeah, I think you know, we've seen some really great smartphone photography in the past few years. And yeah. obviously for uh, a really long shot, you're still gonna need specialized equipment. But I think there's a lot of great photography that can uh, be done to show the environment and show kind of birds flying in the environment that, that doesn't require an expensive DSLR can be shot with your phone. Um, and that to me is very exciting because it's part of this democratization of photography, if you will. And you know, not all of us can carry a 600 millimeter lens like Melissa can and hold a 600 millimeter lens. So a lot of times I'll just pull out that iPhone and you know, take the shot because that's the camera I have. <laughs> sure, love it. Well, thank you both so much for your leadership and your spectacular art. Um, this is one of my favorite times of the year when the Audubon Photography Awards are unveiled. So thank you for making it so special. I know that our viewers really appreciate this as well. Um, so we're gonna drop a link again in the chat to all of the winners from this year's Audubon Photography Awards. Uh, and Melissa and Alan, thank you again so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, I really admire both of your work. So now that we've talked about the best that bird photography has to offer, we wanted to balance it out a little bit and pivot to the worst, but uh, we're seriously gonna be doing that. So uh, there's the hashtag worst bird pick, which is a hashtag popularized by Carl Meacham, known on Twitter as the inept birder. And Carl and hashtag bird Twitter lean into this concept by asking people to share their own worst bird picks um, and ranging anything from those who could have been perfect shots or those that are just completely blurry smartphone photos that we swear of are of birds. Um, I can speak for myself. I have a lot of those personally on my phone. Um, and I think a lot of these, these terrible bird photos are things that we can all relate to. And even if most of them are probably the worst, they can remind us of that special time or place 
um, and bring us back to those memories of, um, of nature and birds. So we decided to have some fun with your worst bird picks and we worked with Carl to put a call out this week asking for some of your own worst bird picks and we've invited a panel of experts including field editor for Audubon magazine Ken Kaufman and Birding, Bergen County Audubon Society volunteer and senior editor for popular science Perbita Saha and my fellow co-host David Ringer the chief network officer of Audubon and lifelong birder. So now we're going to try to stump the expert. And I'm really excited. I'm very nervous, Christine. What? Ken and Pravita, I'm glad we're in this together, but I'm very nervous. <laughs> I'm glad I get to step out of this one because I would definitely <laughs> misidentify all of them. All right, so this is the tweet that we sent out asking everyone to share their worst bird picks. And yeah, hello, Ken, and hello, Pravita. Uh, good evening. Hi, so fun to be here. Yeah, excited to have you all. So let's pull up this first photo that we have lined up. Let's see what it is. And we do not know what the species is yet. So let's ask Ken to ID this first one. Okay. Um, well, I'm wow. tempted to say that it's a, a space alien that's uh, trying to shift into a different <laughs> dimension, but Actually, there's that, there's a flash of yellow, sort of a blur of yellow in the center of the picture, but then over behind the stem, I see what looks like buffy, buffy brown and some black. And it, it sort of suggests a, a flicker, a, the eastern form of uh, northern flicker, as if it were taking off and, and flying toward the right side of the screen. All right, so. You're saying it's a flicker. Let's see what the tweeter says. Northern flicker. Ding, ding, ding. Great. <laughs> ding, ding. <laughs> great, great. All right, Pervita, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, you're going to be <laughs> the person to guess this next one. Let's see. Hmm. What? <laughs> hmm. I don't remember what this one is either. All right, well, size and shape wise, it looks like a warbler to me, uh, although there is some pretty good size variation in warblers. Super bright yellow, and the habitat looks quite swampy. So I will go with the gorgeous prothonotary warbler. Prothonotary warbler, all right, let's see, but, let's see what the computer says. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> oh, amazing. Yeah, Prothonotary Warbler. I love that. <laughs> warbler. That's great. <laughs> um, all right, all right. David, you're Ken up. And Perbita, you're bringing the heat. <laughs> you got Pressure's it. on me. No pressure, no pressure. All right. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> And David, if you want, um, you can you can phone a friend, as in Ken or Perbita. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like this might be a, a committee decision, but let's see what we're looking at. There's a chimney, so we're probably in a neighborhood, and we've got a tree growing near a house. Um, very small bird up near the top, uh, pretty long tail. Um, it looks like a conifer. So that might mean we're up north somewhere or out west. I'm tempted to say northern mockingbird, um, but the conifer, I'm not quite, I'm not quite sure. Ken Perbita, what do you think? Got a long tail, can't really see much about the color. Sitting up there on an exposed perch. Yeah. I think no, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I was, yeah, the long tail is also what I'm homing in on. I'm thinking American kestrel, even though it doesn't make sense with that tree. It could be a bigger bird than, than it looks in the picture, and kestrels are very widespread across the country. It does kind of look like solid. a kestrel. Let's okay. see. Let's see. Ken, what do you think? Without blowing it up, um, I think sometimes the correct answer is, I don't know. <laughs> That's a good, good answer. Let's see what we got. 
Oh. Sharpshin Hawk. What? Wow. How? Based that's on the hard... call, because I didn't have my binoculars with me. Oh. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, some of those small raptors are tough, uh, even even with binoculars. So I don't necessarily think of a sharpshin hawk sitting at the very top of a tree like that. Uh, Prabita, I think you're onto something with, with American kestrel, maybe even Merlin. Mm. Oh, nice. Yeah. And all of these contestants, you're welcome to uh, contend with the tweeters themselves if you believe, you know, that you have an ID. <laughs> All right, yeah. so we're going to go back to Ken for the next one. Let's see what it is. Great. <laughs> oh, <laughs> one. It's a shark. Well, yeah, it looks like <laughs> um, a whole bunch of sharks um, uh, punishing the photographer for taking such a bad photo. <laughs> um, Either that or it, it could be, yeah, it could be something like common MERS diving underwater. But, yeah, without without blowing it up larger, I wouldn't put a species on it. Fair. Yeah, so it's pointed, very pointed wing tips and the black mm -hmm. and white body from what we can see. Very short tail. I like your common MER hypothesis, Kim. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see what it is. Oh, razor, razor bill. bill. Razor bill. Razor bill yeah. butt. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have thought the tail looked long enough for that, but I'm. Yeah, that, that's that's quite plausible. Okay. Sounds good. All right, we got a sounds good from Ken. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see what the next one is. Perbita, you're up. <laughs> oh. Oh, this one. This Come one. on. <laughs> At least it's centered, almost. Um, <laughs> hmm. Is that a bird? E, huh. I I think it looks blue. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have a lot of clues here, but I'm going to lean heavily on habitat. Um, we've got like some sort of shrubby field, forest edge, which I think indigo buntings like a lot. I don't know if it's bright enough to be an indigo bunting, but also it looks like it was taken through binoculars, so that could be playing up the color. Yeah, I'll go, I don't know. I'll go with indigo bunting, but I would love to hear what David and Ken think. Just for the record, a bird is also an acceptable guess. Um, yes, bird, birds, the yeah. species. Cool. Hmm. It looks like the same color of blue as you'd get in like a slushy or a snow cone. <laughs> so it could be that <laughs> instead of a bird. Yeah, I don't think I have much to add other than wondering if maybe it's larger than it seems from the mm. picture, maybe yeah. a raptor or something. But let's see what we got. Oh, you! There's two of them. What? I only see one. <laughs> oh, I see it. It's in the bottom left corner. Amazing. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh wow, yeah. Way down <laughs> in the bottom left corner. Okay. Um, are black wow. kites? Do we have them up here in the U.S.? No, it's the old world replacement uh, for our white-tailed kite. They used to be considered the same species, but they're they're a lot shorter tailed. Interesting. Cool. Oh. Wow, that was a tough one. All right, let's go back to David for this next one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this. Okay, so clearly with the vignetting, we've got something that's taken through a binocular um, piece or a scope maybe. Uh, it's on what looks like a deck and it's clearly carrying something, um, which looks like a green bundle of moss. Uh, there's a tarp over in the top. Maybe there's some furniture or a grill or something that's been covered. And one of the birds that often gets itself in trouble for nesting in spots like this is the Carolina wren. Uh, they also use moss in their nests. 
And so the, I believe this is the Carolina Wren that's got some moss building a nest on someone's deck. You can see kind of a blurred white ice stripe, some rufous on the top, some cinnamon on the bottom. So I'm going to go with Carolina Wren for this one. Cool. A very educated guess. Let's see what the tweeter says. And you're right. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> that was wonderfully methodical, David. Could write a whole book yeah. about that ID that you just did. <laughs> you just start a blog. We should do a book with all of these. It's a great idea. Yeah. All right. I'm sure Carl would, would be excited about it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right, let's go to the next one. And Ken is up. <laughs> Is there a bird in there someplace? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I was wondering the same thing. Ken, I'm looking oh, at the, the flower bud in the middle. Right, right yeah, in the center just there. there. Right there. Okay, well the plant the plant looks like like an artichoke or something I've seen on the west coast. Uh-huh. If um if it's a bird that's sort of faced toward us and the top of the, if we're seeing the top of the head and then part of the body and the top of the head is really, really brown, that would look like the, um, the West Coast subspecies of the bush tit. And with that size compared to the flower head, the, the size would make sense. But, you know, it could easily be, you know, not a bird at all. <laughs> right, I'll, I'll guess a, a, a bush did of the, the West Coast race. The, the ones in the interior of the West aren't that brown on top of the head. All right, so bush tit is the guess or a bird. Oh, you're right. Oh. Wow. Fantastic. I liked that you used the size of the plant as an indicator as well. That was really. Plants for birds. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> With the hashtag. So you know, bush oh, tits have, are such tiny birds. Yeah. Um, so we have a comment from one of our viewers, Lay, who says that this is my first time tuning in and the game is my favorite part. I'm texting <laughs> my friends who are all on the call and we love it. That's amazing. <laughs> Terrific. Thanks, Lee. All right, Pravita, you are up next. Let's see what it is. Okay. All right. That's doable. <laughs> so we've got that long tail. And looks like it's got something in its beak, but I can't tell for sure. Um, I wish it was inside profile so that I could get a look at that honker, but I, I'm going to go with Northern Mockingbird just because it's so common and widespread and just seems more likely. Um, any, any rebuttals from the group? Well, I think that looks like a choice. White, uh, white adder tail feathers, it looks like, since we're seeing the underside of the tail. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Good call. Yeah, good guess. All right, let's see what it is. And you're right, Northern Mockingbird. Bravo. Yay, bravo. <laughs> Um, yeah, I've been great seeing way to great way to call it, Pravita. Go ahead, Christine. Sorry. Um, oh yeah, so we're just we're just gonna go to the next one. Let's see, David, you're up. So, <laughs> drone roll. <laughs> I see colors. Uh, <laughs> it's I a bird. <laughs> I I think there are two birds in this picture, oh, and uh, yes. earlier. So obviously, we're, it appears we're looking at the ground with some plants and the tree trunk there. Um, so Perbita guessed earlier on for one of the pictures, the blue bird could be an indigo bunning. I think that, you know, when indigo bunnings come to our yard during spring migration, we often see them feeding on the ground, on weed seeds. So I think the blue dot toward the bottom center is an indigo bunning. And then there's a red dot just to the left of the tree trunk there on the right side. And I would guess that's the Northern Cardinal, which also like to feed on the ground on seeds. Why would you rule out um, blue grosbeak? Oh, good question. Um, to my eye, 
Lou Grosbeak has a slightly more purpley hue to its body feathers. Mm -hmm. And indigo buntings have a little bit more of a sky blue undertone. Um, so I think with, the, with a picture like this, it might be a little hard to tell that. But to me, this really clear, bright blue looks a little bit more like an indigo bunting color. And on, an, on a, a blue ghost beak, I might expect something a little bit darker, a little more purpley or, or navy looking. But let's see if I'm right or wrong. Yeah, yeah let's see. And it is indigo bunting and cardinal. <laughs> A blob of blue. Well, wow, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> exactly. I should just describe all the birds, blobs, yep. and forbs, <laughs> and verbs. <laughs> all right. So we will close out this segment with a final guess. And Ken, this one is for you. <laughs> I don't suppose you could blow it up some. I mean, if I were... Uh... If oh, I were yeah. looking at it. Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, oh okay. Um, <laughs> we're getting a, a hint it, from our. Oh, yeah, there we go. It's central there. Um, was sitting on like a wood pile or something, and I'm guessing it's something fairly large, and the top of the head. The top of the head looks red and pointed. Um, so if, if this is in North America somewhere, what it would suggest is a uh, pileated woodpecker, um, you know, unless it's like an ivory bill. It's it's like the ivory bill photos I've seen. Um, but... Oh, Ken, you're looking to start something here on this show tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. No, no, run away. Um, yeah, I'm going to guess that it's someplace in North America and that it's a pileated woodpecker. Pileated woodpecker. Good guess. All right, let's see what it is. Oh, okay. Yeah, the red crest gives it away. Yeah, thanks for blowing the, uh, the photo. I wouldn't have had a chance. <laughs> yeah, these are all good guesses. Everyone, I'm super impressed because I would not have been able to provide an answer nearly as metho methodical. Um, so big thank you to all three of you. And thank you to all of our viewers and followers who have been tweeting and submitting these worst bird picks. And yeah, this was super fun. And we've really enjoyed sharing this segment with all of you. Yes, and well, Ken and Prabita, it's it. always such a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, always enjoy it. So well, thanks very much. You guys are doing amazing work here. To know that. And thank please you so keep sharing your worst bird picks. Yes, Keep please sharing do. those worst bird picks, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you both. Uh, well, bringing I Saw a Bird to You is truly one of the highlights of the month for Christine and me and the whole team that works to put out this program. Uh, we originally hashed up this plan to keep us connected and bring some more joy to all of our lives during this terrible pandemic that we're facing across the country and the world. Um, I don't think we knew where the show would go or what to expect. Uh, certainly didn't expect to be grilled on the last segment like that, um, but a lot of fun and we look forward to it each, each time we do a show. Um, so in the meantime, until we get together again in August, we wanted to make a plug for joining Audubon to support our work and programs like this and our conservation efforts if you can. Um, we always end the show by saying, if there's one thing you do for birds this week, and so this week, if there's one thing you can do for birds, we'd love to ask you to join Audubon with a contribution. Um, if you visit audubon.org slash give now, you can make a donation as little as $5. You can become a, a sustaining monthly donor, which provides stability to all of our programs. And it's support from viewers like you that help power Audubon Magazine, the Audubon Photography Awards, video programs like I Saw a Bird, and most importantly, of course, our conservation work across the hemisphere and in communities near you. So if you can, we'd love for you to join us in support today. Again, the URL, which we'll put in the comments, is audubon.org slash give now. We'd appreciate it very much. And if you give $20 or more, you'll also receive a year's worth of Audubon magazine in your mailbox. So with that, have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. We will see you in August.